So when we first moved the house to our first place, which is where we lived illegally, like under the radar, we put up skirting over the winter and <laughs> we accidentally like screwed a screw right into our tire. <laughs> Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 196 with Melanie Copeland. I was excited to finally sit down with Melanie Copeland because it seems like her name is everywhere between a book that is charting on the Amazon bestseller list, involvement with Tiny House Alliance USA. Melanie is a mover and a shaker in the tiny house world. She also has an amazing personal story of renovating a tiny house in just seven days. So stick around to hear all about Melanie Copeland's tiny lifestyle and what she is doing in the tiny house movement. But before we get to that, I have one quick ask for you. As the Tiny House Lifestyle podcast approaches 200 episodes, I just wanted to say thank you to all my listeners. I love to hear from you. I love doing this show and all the great conversations that I get to share with you each week. So if you like Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, my ask to you is please share the show with someone who you think will like it. Take their phone, show them how to subscribe to a podcast, or just show them that they can go over to thetinyhouse.net slash THLP and listen to the shows right there on the page. I'm also experimenting with adding the shows to YouTube so you can watch slash listen in the background. So again, my ask is just please share an episode or the show with someone that you think will like it or post it on social media, however you like to do it. It's always great to find new listeners and I really appreciate your support. So again, please share the show with someone you think will like it. All right, on to the show. I am here with Melanie Copeland. Melanie is a tiny dweller and advocate for legal parking. She built her tiny house with her husband and three friends in seven days and worked with her county to legally park on her own land. She's the author of Trailblazing Tiny, A Guide to Breaking Free, and the national spokesperson for the Tiny House Alliance USA, where they work to advance tiny housing for veterans and encourage building trades in schools with tiny house projects. Melanie Copeland, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So <laughs> seven days. How How is that possible? Can right. you tell the story of that? <laughs> right. Well, it was a really rough seven days. <laughs> it wasn't easy. So we actually, about four years ago, we built with a company called Incredible Tiny Homes. Okay. And they used to offer workshops. And so what you would do is you would work with their designer and get a design. And for the most part, these were very simple, tiny houses. Um, So you're not talking houses that are, you know, 28 feet, 10 feet wide. Like these were simple, basic homes that you could come in with your crew and build in seven days. Okay. So you would arrive and they would have all the material set up there for you. They gave you a supervisor, but he was mostly there to teach us how to use tools that we didn't know. He wasn't there for labor or work. They provided an an electrician and a plumber and some of those people to come in and make sure that everything was on the up and up. And then the five of us built. Wow. So (laughs) we built (laughs) from five in the morning sometimes till some mornings till one or two or three o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't say we rushed and ran a whole bunch. We took our breaks, but they were really long days. Yeah. So, wow. that Do they still do this? <laughs> they don't. But during the course of their workshops, I believe there were close to 30 tiny homes that were built this way. So it wasn't just ours. There was a lot of us that did it. Wow. That's, I mean, no judgment, but that's insane. It as a was company in- to offer that. <laughs> it was in it was fun. It was a blast. Like I wish they still did it because you learn so much in that week and you're really just immersed in it. And 
you're, you're having a blast. You're having so much fun. And, and when you run into a problem, there's somebody there to help you. So you're not, you know, snagged and getting held up. And yeah, we, we really learned a lot. In fact, I learned so much that I do contract carpentry now. Wow. So, so oh. how much, how much experience did you have before you started the house? Not a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm a pretty mechanical person. So I'll just be up front there. Like I like tools. I don't find Uh that stuff hard for me to jump in and do, but as far as ever having done any type of framing or no, mm -mm. wow, I'd use the, I don't even think I'd use the circular saw, maybe just like a drill and some, Mm -hmm. some basic stuff, put, put pre-built furniture together. Right. (laughs) Yeah. But the confidence coming out of building a home in seven days and knowing that I could pick up a tool and know how to use it just kind of allowed me to continue to be able to build the things that I wanted to add to the home after the build. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, so I, you know, now I go and I do framing work on contract when I want. And wow. I build wow. furniture for other tiny dwellers and different things. So it's been it it was a pretty life changing experience. <laughs> That's to say the yeah. least. Kind of yeah. from from zero to hero, tiny house builder. <laughs> That's crazy, yeah. <laughs> so what what kind of contract carpentry work do you do now? So I work with an Amish crew in the area that when okay. they do framing, um, the guys usually call me out to help with the framing. Oh, cool. Okay. So that's the majority of what I like to do. And then I, I do build some cabinets or different custom pieces of furniture, shelves, and things like that that will fit into other people's tiny houses because we all have these restrictions on our build and what we can actually create in the spaces. So it's hard to find items that work. Yeah. So I've, I've done a few custom items like that for other tiny dwellers. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Been fun. So, um, that is fascinating. Tell me about <laughs> tell me about your tiny house. Like, uh, give me the specs for your tiny house. Sure. Yeah, we're an eight by eighteen. Okay. So again, very simple. I have two lofts. I'm in my four foot loft right now. My eight foot loft holds a California king bed. Woohoo! Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it was built to be on and off grid. So we have like a composting toilet. We have a a water reclamation system. We're hooked up to a well right now and we do operate on power, but our power bill is about 20, maybe 20, 30 bucks a month. Okay. So it's, it's a pretty simple build. Uh, we have like a four degree pitch. So that allows my roof to have this big bulk area in it. Yeah. So I have a lot of space yeah. up here and I built it to look like a log cabin. So it's just got a very simple you know, flat log siding exterior that, Mm -hmm. that looks like a little log cabin and it's brown with green trim and a green roof. So nice. Nice. Yeah. And, um, any special features or, or kind of personalizations that, that make it yours? Yeah. So, um, we're big proponents of the hammock life. (laughs) Ah, Okay. (laughs) So our main seating is hammocks. And I've been promoting it for like four years. I don't know why more people don't have these hammocks, but they're amazing and we've loved them. So, Are they the like top bar hammocks where it's like a seat or are they the like reclining hammock? Yeah, they're a seat. Okay. Yep. So they're the top bar and they, but they can fold out. You can lay back in them. You don't really do that with them though. And they're an all cloth. Okay type of hammock so they don't have that little mesh like string stuff that you sit in yeah so they're really comfortable and yeah so that those fold out of the way and then we have our whole downstairs areas basically open nice and we've loved that it's it's been an exceptional way to have a transformation type space in a tiny where there's not a lot of room for furniture right yeah so i'm i'm imagining you can just kind of clip it to the wall to get it yep. out of the way when you're not using it or we've even unhooked it and just thrown it in a loft when we yep. want to use the downstairs space so it's been so i think that's kind of our i think that's our most creative thing that we have because we're 
we're a very simple, tiny house, so there's not a lot to it. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, like, do you have other seating, like for eating dinner? Is there a, uh, like a table and chairs or anything, or is it all hammock? It's two hammocks and there's a flip up table in between. So, and, and underneath that, there's like a little storage for wine and wine glasses and the table folds up, but mostly we don't eat at the table like that. We just set our drink or our bowl there. Okay. And so you're holding it while you're sitting in the hammock. There is not space for entertaining, although I could probably just pull the hammocks and put in some fold up chairs and fit four to six people. Yeah. We didn't design the house for that. So it's pretty much all hammocks, <laughs> <laughs> which is great for us. It yeah. That's been cool. great. I, yeah. You, uh, you're saying us. So do you live in the house with multiple other people? Just your husband? Yeah. My husband and we have a 50 pound dog. Wow. And he has two tiny house puppy areas and then he has a cubby under our stairs and he has a spot in the back with his own puppy bed uh, but most of the time he's like out in the yard with the chickens and you know protecting his rooster nice <laughs> so, nice um so he spends a lot of time out there because that's where he wants to be fantastic yeah so where um how how you said this was five years ago that you built? Four. Four years ago. Almost four now. Yeah. Yep. I always like to ask, going on eight years since I finished my tiny, I'm always curious to ask what kind of maintenance things, what has broken that you've had to fix? What has broken? Okay. <laughs> Luckily, let's like knock on some wood here because it really hasn't been a yeah. lot. <laughs> we have had most of our issues I guess have been exterior issues and mm -hmm. they've had to do with like we've had carpenter bees pouring into our soffits mm. so and we've had our wood crack on the outside where we've had to go back and put like wood filler and make sure that our caulking is sitting okay on one of our on one of our moves and mind you we built this really fast so like when we cut our exterior boards some of them were cut super tight and some were cut a little loose well one of the boards on the outside we cut super tight up to the trim piece on the the side where it fits in yeah so it would be the board laying into the corner and we screwed them in and during the move one of the screws sheared off and so that board has now lifted and we'll have to pull and replace it so during transport you know those kinds of things just get bumped around it's the nature of of wood yeah so we've had some some things like that break we've had to replace um our mini fridge that died but it made it almost three years yeah yeah <laughs> so that's you know for these little the littler appliances like the instapots and things don't normally tend to last as long as a traditional stove yeah so i feel like we've gone through i think we've had two or three toaster ovens now we're on our second Instapot, stuff like that. But as far as other things in the actual house breaking, it really hasn't been anything else that or needed much maintenance. Well, that's great. We have hardwood floors, so it's not they've held up really well in four years. And all of the windows, we haven't had any leaks or any problems with those either. So great. Great. We just had to add um like silicone re re caulk on the outside okay each year okay yeah so there's it's just a, been a lot of exterior maintenance more than anything else and um and two flat tires <laughs> just like you know did, did that happen during transport no so when we first moved the house to our first place which is where we lived illegally like under the radar mm -hmm. We put up skirting over the winter and <laughs> we accidentally like screwed a screw right into our tire. <laughs> so yeah, we heard it go. We're like, all right, yeah, that was that was <laughs> bad. And you know, live and learn. And then we had one on the other side that just went flat and we don't know why. So we had to replace both of those and they're about a hundred bucks a pop. So it wasn't awful, but yeah. You do have to have some spares when your house rolls. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've always, I've always 
thought to myself that if I was going to do a big move that I would probably just preemptively re- replace all four tires before doing it. Just because I would have, agree. Mine have essentially been sitting for eight years. Um, sometimes on right. the trailer, sometimes off. I haven't done a particularly good job of taking care of them. <laughs> right. I mean, like you put something over them and then you live in your house. So you don't right. really think about, I I'm in agreement. I mean, we've been on our land almost two years now. And yeah. if I was to pick it up and roll it off this property, I would be putting four new tires on it. I, yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, it's just not, it's not that expensive to ensure that the house is gonna roll down the road safely. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that a lot of, when I was, when I was working on the second edition of, of tiny house decisions, I really did a deep dive on tires and the the tires that come with the trailer aren't usually the highest rated for for heavy loads and long distances. Right. They kind of they kind of tend to cheap out a little bit and so right. It is a worth worthwhile upgrade. And considering how much these trailers cost that actually surprises me because they're not cheap. So you no. think that they would come with a pretty decent tire. So but yeah, I would agree the ones that came with yeah. mine weren't like super high end tires yeah. either. So yeah. But they they've gotten me around with a few spares, so <laughs> good, good. <laughs> moved a few times. It's all been good. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So tell me about your land because I know that um, you know you you had quite an adventure legalizing <laughs> getting to live in your own house on your own land. Right. So we lived illegally for almost a year, and then we lived in a campground for another seven, eight months. Did you have to leave the illegal place because that you were forced to leave or you just decided to leave? No, uh, we decided to leave because we were frustrated with being illegal. Like we did, we came home every day and we're basically looking at our door, waiting for the sticker telling us you got to roll out. Yeah. Yeah. Like it just sucked. It wasn't the way that we wanted to live, but we just didn't have, we didn't have an option. Right. So And when we first moved there, we were still doing all the painting and staining and stuff of the outside. So we were kind of of the mind that if someone asked questions, we were still in the building process. Right. But once we got all that done, we were no longer in the building process. We were dimming our lights every night. We were not sitting chairs outside. We were acting like we weren't living in it. It was sad. It just wasn't like I I wanted to sit outside or hang out in the yard. And I couldn't do that because it would kind of expose the fact that I was living in this. And so we had been searching and searching. And a campground that I'd actually called before we went tiny, I called a year later and spoke to them. And they said, yeah, we'll let you in now because things had changed. So we went there. And I didn't really love the campground life I didn't hate it but I wasn't a camper like this is my home these people came to the campground to you know party over the weekend and have a great time and you know (laughs) I was like a million campfires so my smoke alarms going off and (laughs) just like and they had a lot of stuff it was I met a lot of great people and it was fun but it it's not a home it's not a home type environment It's an entertainment environment. Right. So I have a group called the Virginia Tiny House Supporters and people all over the state had been putting calls out to different counties, myself included, looking for counties that would let us in. And I just started calling, you know, counties that were around me and spreading out (laughs) to see how far away we had to get. And I finally got through to a zoning administrator who was willing to talk to me and work with me to make this happen. Yeah. And it was not an easy process. It was difficult the whole way through from, you know, picking the parcel of property that we would be allowed to be on through the building inspector, through the health department, through the zoning requirements, setback requirements, septic requirements. But we did it. And we, we found out the campground was being sold and it was being sold to a company that has several other campgrounds in the area that don't allow tiny houses. So we were kind of under the gun at the campground that it was like, 
we knew we were going to be asked to leave. And so when we got the opportunity to buy the land, I think we put our offer in in July or August. We closed in October and we were moved on to the land in November. Nice. So it was fast. It was furious. It was a lot of travel. It was a lot of trying to get contractors to come and do the work for us, which was horrible. <laughs> what kind of work did you need to get down on the land? Well, we needed to have the RV hookup for the septic line. Okay. We had to retrench the electric lines so that they could build a rack for us to power up to. And we had to have the power company come out. They had to replace a pole on the property and we had to have a driveway put in. Okay. So that's quite, that's quite a bit. Yeah. And so we were, you know, struggling getting the people out here to get that done for us. And in fact, when we, when we drove onto the property with the tiny house, we still had the septic line had been put in, but the inspector hadn't approved it yet. So he had to come the next day. So our first night, we couldn't even hook into it yet Mm. because it wasn't inspected. So I don't recommend doing it as fast as we did, but sometimes when you don't have the options, you take what you (laughs) you take what you can, right? But we're here and we pay our taxes and we love it. And we're happy to be parked on our wheels legally. And it's been wonderful. Nice. Yeah. How how do you get water there? Oh, uh, we have a well. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Our own well. So yeah, it's cool. <laughs> so it's been a it's been a amazing process. And I hope, you know, I work with um the Tiny House Alliance and one of the initiatives we've been working on is the ASTM one. Yep. To create standards for tiny houses. And I feel like you know, with the potential to have standards for tiny homes, there could be more people on their property like this. Okay. You know, and that's what I hope for more people to be able to have their own land. How do you think having standards would have helped you in your kind of quest to, to legalize on your own land? Sure. So, you know, I had to work with a building inspector and try to explain to him how I built this and how it fit, you know, into his building codes and his standards, which, yeah, you know, they, they're doing their job. I get it. They have a select set of papers that they have to follow. But when you come to them with something that they've never seen before and you yeah. can't explain what you are. And you can't explain how you hook up other than just trying to vocalize it. But you don't have anything to back it up, even though you know what you're saying is right. You're not trying to lie to somebody or manipulate them. But there's nobody standing behind you saying, hey, this is the right way to do this. So I feel like had I come in with paperwork or a standard and said, look, this is my home. This is how it could be handled. This is how we can hook it up. This is how it it needs to successfully be tied down. And take the liability off the county to make those decisions. It would be much easier for counties to say, "Look, we we've got something to play with now." So yeah, I really think it's it will make a huge difference to have some type of standards for these homes. Right, yeah. right. And so, when you say that it kind of takes liability away, like they didn't have to decide what this what they're looking for. You just can say, these are the standards, the ASTM standards, we built to these standards, and they can either say yay, yes or no to that. Right. Yeah. Cool. And they don't have to try to, you know, decide because like my building inspector was trying to decide how to tie me down and I have four tie downs, one on each corner, Mm -hmm. but mobile home specs for my county require six tie downs. I'm not the size of a mobile home. So had I had proper standards for this, I could have shown him that I don't necessarily need to, you know, put two more tie downs on my trailer Mm -hmm. to hold me down from blowing over. Mm. But there's nothing there that shows him that that's going to be an acceptable thing to do for this type of structure. Right. So, yeah. and, And then it does become their liability if something, if they approve it and something happens to my home. Then do I turn around and say, well, you let me do it. <laughs> like, not that I would do that, but I mean, that's 
what can happen. And I feel like there's a lot of reasons that counties don't allow these in. And I think standards would take a lot of burden off of them. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. From a consumer standpoint, because, you know, when you're working as a consumer and you're, you're, it's your home and it's your land and your money, and you're not coming in as an agency to them, you don't, you don't have a lot to play with as a consumer to help you. We're just sitting here going, this is my house. (laughs) Somebody want to help me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And they don't know what to do. So you don't get any help. So it's this crossroads that, you know, as consumers, we need, we need something to work with. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So the, the ASTM did vote to form the committee. Correct. Um, what are the next steps there or what's happening next? So we are waiting right now. I believe it went to Cotco for their approval and we're hoping to know when the committees will be formed. Uh, it should be soon. Exciting. <laughs> it should be soon. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, so I wanted to ask kind of next and, and turn to your book, Trailblazing Tiny. Sure. What, um, who's the book for? So the book is for consumers and it is set up like a workbook. Mm -hmm. It tells our story of what we did, why we decided to go tiny all the way through legalizing our land, but it actually has sections in it where people can take notes and track what they need to do. Everything from how to create a floor plan for a tiny house, how to plan for what to do for each section of your home, how to design your lofts or your kitchen spaces, all the way through tracking things like who your zoning officials are, websites that you follow, tips and tricks and information. So it's it's a pretty extensive book. Yeah. And then to top it off, I interviewed 16 other tiny dwellers. So if I lived in an RV park, which I did, and told my view of it, I interviewed somebody else who's lived in an RV park. So you're getting different views from different people, people who have bought their land and what they've done and people who have built their home, just like I built my home and what they would do different. So, because as much as my story is a cool story and I'm happy to share it, I am one of many consumers that live tiny. This is a very big industry now. And I feel like the ability to share other people's stories is more important because there's a lot of us doing it. Yeah. It's not just a few anymore. (laughs) So, and to show people that it can be done because I feel like, you know, you get in the Facebook groups or you get on in meetups and, and everybody just sits there and it becomes a very, it can become a very negative environment that there's so many hurdles to overcome. that Nobody is getting through. Mm. And that's just not the case. A lot of us are getting through. You just don't hear about it all the time. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I'm, if you could do it, well, actually I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> um, how is the, how is the response to the book been? The response to the book has been really amazing. Nice. <laughs> so it is still rapidly selling off of Amazon. Nice. The book sales have been phenomenal. I've been invited to do several speaking events. I'm actually starting another series, which is starting in January. And it's called Trailblazing Tiny Tales. Mm-hmm. So those will be little 99 cent ebooks and they'll all be on one topic. So the Wait. first one's going to be zoning. Okay. Yay. And um, just just a ton of information, a lot of fun, a quick little download. And I'm thinking that those will be really helpful for consumers to know how to work with zoning. Each month, they'll have a different topic. So the next one will be like downsizing or parking or how to design a kitchen. And I am talking to other tiny dwellers in these little eBooks as well. Cool. Cool. Those will be fun. And yeah, and the book is is just going great. And I hope that I can make it to a few of the tiny house shows this year coming. So it's been, um, it's been better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Like I would have just been happy to sell one and have the book help somebody. 
if it sold one and it helped that one person, then it was worth my time to write it. And the fact that it's selling hundreds and hundreds of copies is beyond what I ever thought it would do. So great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was a lot of work and I'm I'm glad to see it helping people. This is a long, this is a long book. Yeah. So it's not a little book. It's 444 pages. Yeah. It's over an inch thick. Yeah. It's not, it's not a little book at all. And the back of it has, you know, note sections and places to draft stuff and, you know, graph sheets to draw out a picture of your tiny house layout. Fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's got a lot of information in it. So awesome. It was, it was a ton of work. <laughs> it, was, it was not like I just sat down and wrote it real fast. It, it took a lot of time. Yeah. No, writing, writing is hard. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's the understatement, <laughs> understatement of the year. Right. <laughs> so I'm glad I did it though. And I'm glad that it's, it's helping people. So good. Good. If you were going to build another tiny house, what would you do differently? Sure. Yeah, I get this one a lot. And I I think my answer surprises a lot of people. If we were to build again, I think we would build smaller. Wow. Okay. Why? Mind you, we have an 18 foot tiny house, but I feel like we still have a lot of space that we don't necessarily use. We found a way to use it, but I don't feel like it's been... Mm -hmm. I think one, because we built so simple, we've been able to add in or make the changes, but I feel like if I was to build again, I would probably end up with like a downstairs with a Murphy bed or something that folded up instead of maybe the upstairs loft. Mm. I don't know that I would make a lot of changes in like the systems that I chose, but maybe I would add some more windows. And I selectively picked like to have more windows on one side and less on the other to kind of do passive heating and cooling. Yeah. So I could turn my house in the winter, get more sun. But I found that when I sit in this loft, I have one window. So if someone was to come to my door right now, I can't see them. Mm. So I feel like I'm kind of blinded in some of these spaces okay. because of that. Okay. Even though it does help with my heating and cooling bills. So, you know, kind of a draw on that one, I guess. And I think that I would, now my husband would tell you he would add two feet on and have a ladder that comes up the back. So we have differences in what we would do if we built again. So a ladder that comes up the back, like on the outside yeah. of the house? No, goes up like the back wall to the loft. Instead okay. of having the ladder in the living room, he would move it against the back wall, going mm. across the eight feet, coming up to the back. Okay. And put storage in that. But he would add two feet on and then leave our living room the same. So we have different ideas of what we would do if we wanted to rebuild from living in it. And, um, you know, and that's the fun part about it is that you do, you know, you don't always know what you're going to need or want when you're building one of these because you never lived in one. But after you've lived in one, you're like, oh, I know what I want now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Any plans to do that, To, to build another one or change it up? No, no plans to build another one. Very happy in this one. We have thought about possibly doing like a little bus or a van conversion at some point to travel in. Yeah. But, you know, right now we're just, we're working on our land and we've got a whole bunch of chickens and gardens and we're canning and um, we're going to build like a little hobbit house root cellar and fun. we're just kind of enjoying the homesteading stuff right now. So yeah, how much, how much land do you own now? So we own just a little over an acre and it's kind of up on a hill here. But when you go down the side of the hill, one whole side of our property is a stream. Okay. So we're actually water property and we want to build like a platform with a gazebo down there and a little bridge. And so we've been, you know, the material costs have been so high in the past couple of years. Everything yeah. just skyrocketed. Yeah. It put everything really on hold for us to build because I was not going to pay $8,000 for a fence and yep. like some of these crazy prices. So we've just kind of held off. But um, yeah, they're coming back down. So hopefully we'll be able to 
get a few more things going here and yeah. Great. Great. Yep. <laughs> now are you allowed, would you be allowed to park another tiny house on your property or are you just allowed the one? So in my county, you are allowed to park another tiny house. It's considered like a civil agreement. Mm -hmm. As long as you are safe and proper with hookups. But given the layout of my land, it would be very difficult to park a second one. Okay. Because this was a distressed property. So there was a house that burnt down here and we had it tore down. But the way our lines, like our septic lines run, it, it would be a lot of work to get another okay. another tiny house here. We don't really intend to do like any type of Airbnb or stuff like that. It's yeah. But you know, the people who live in this county could certainly have them in backyards as um civil agreements with the county if those homeowners wanted to put in septic and electric and, and water hookups for them. Um, what, what infrastructure do you have like supporting the house? Like what is it parked on? So right now we are parked on, on dirt. (laughs) We are on concrete cat blocks and our jacks are lowered, but they're not like weight bearing, Mm -hmm. you know, jacks. They're just lowered down. So our wheels are lifted up. We do intend to pour a pad next year. And we'd like to anchor down, but that was not a requirement of our county to be here. Mm -hmm. And so um, we parked in the spot that we're parked in right now just to be far enough away from where the old house was because we had to bring in the heavy equipment to tear that down. Okay. And so we want to reposition the home and we'll put it in its permanent spot and then tie it down. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So that's just... Some things that you have to plan in a certain order because of what was already here that we couldn't change. Right, right. Right. Any tips on finding properties like that? Because that's ideal for a tiny house to find a property that already has the uh, the septic system, already has the well, already has the electricity, but the house is gone, so the cost is less. Right. So what I did was I did Zillow and Trulia Mm -hmm. searches. I also had, I was working with a, it it wasn't the reason that I got the land, but I was working with a realtor at the time. Okay. So I did have access to the MLS, but the MLS is what realtors use to list property. Okay. So you can, any realtor can do a property search for you. But you can set up in the on Zillow through the MLS search to search out properties that are less than two acres or less than one acre. And then you can select all of those options for land, but you want to, it'll give you options to do like a, a townhouse or a duplex or all these things. But there are more options in there than mm-hmm. just that to search off of. And then you can get those sent to your inbox. And that's how I found this land. Nice. Okay. So it's no different than what anybody else could do. And I did find that in rural areas like where I'm at, it's more common when I would call the realtors here to talk to them about the land, they would say, oh, well, I have a buddy out here. He wants to sell one acre. Let me give him a call. Yeah. See, they had things that weren't even listed. Right. Right. So you almost have to call your local agents. Do you know anybody who wants to just peel off an acre? Right. You know, of their, they own a hundred acres. I want to buy two. Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes it's a lot of word of mouth. And, and the other thing in these um, rural counties is that it's, it's your local newspaper that's listing them. It's not Mm. the internet. They're not there yet. So wow. they're still listing a lot of stuff in newspapers and they're still just putting up flyers in little towns and cities to try to yeah. sell their stuff. So you kind of got to go a little old school with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, we just ran our search on the, on the Zillow, on the MLS and got it. And you're in, you're in Virginia, correct? I am. Yeah. What is happening on the state level in Virginia in terms of tiny houses? So we have passed Appendix Q. Mm -hmm. 
for tiny houses here, but we don't have anything for tiny houses on wheels as it pertains. Okay. As far as I know, there aren't any county, state, city regulations for tiny houses that have passed besides Appendix Q, and that really only works with foundations. Okay. So um, that's kind of where we're sitting at the moment. Got it. Got it. So some some motion, but not not much. Right. And, you know, some of the counties, like the one that I'm in, it's the lack of regulation in these agricultural areas that will let you in because they're willing to work with you. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the town where my tiny house is parked, they actually have now passed a tiny house ordinance, but they didn't, even before they quote unquote legalized tiny houses, there was no building code. Like there's no building right. inspector. Right. It's kind of like, if you want to build something unsafe, that's like your choice. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, and the house that we tore down, yeah. that that foundation didn't even go as far down as it would have with code today. Right. Because it was right. so old. Yeah. 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 Well, one thing that I like to ask all of my guests is, you know, obviously besides your book, which is, sounds like a really great resource, what are two or three resources that, that helped you while you were exploring or building your tiny house that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Okay. Well, I would say, you know, Facebook groups Mm -hmm. were a huge resource for me. I was able to ask a lot of questions. I got a ton of ideas. People are amazingly creative and kind in this community. And that's one of the reasons that I really just love it. Yeah. I feel like everybody has been so helpful and kind to us along the way. I've I've made some really great friends and I, I appreciate that. So. I, I'd say get in a couple. Uh, you don't have to max out like 30, 40 groups. <laughs> Just okay. find a couple. Yep. And, um, you know, start interacting with those ones and see what kind of responses you're getting. The other thing is join a local group. Mm. If you don't have a local group, look for a meetup group. Look for, you know, a group online that's kind of in your state or area. because. What's going on in your local areas and where you're trying to park, it, it's most helpful to talk to other people that are facing the same problems as you ah, to get around. Okay. That has been, that was the game changer for us to get linked, to find a place to park. That that really was it. And, you know, as far as building or designing a tiny house, get on YouTube. And start looking at what it takes. Look up framing. Look up how houses are framed. Look up how to put up lap siding. I mean, there's videos on all of these things so that you have some idea of what it takes to do construction, what you should be looking for in a house that's built if you're not the one building it. Yeah. If you don't know a product or a design of something, find a YouTube video and learn. And make sure that your home is being built right. Make sure things are being done properly. Great. So those would be my recommendations. <laughs> awesome. Well, Melanie Copeland, thank you so much for, for being a guest today. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ethan. It was great to be here. Thank you so much to Melanie Copeland for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including links to Melanie's website and books plus a full transcript of this episode at thetinyhouse.net slash 196. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 196. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.